Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez with Faith Matters. We're super excited about today's episode. And while many Faith Matters listeners know and love today's guest, those who've joined us just this year may not be familiar with him quite yet. We spoke with Thomas Wordland McConkie, who is one of the most fascinating Latter-day Saints you'll ever meet. Coming from a family that claimed LDS apostles on both sides, Thomas left the church as a teenager, moving to China and deeply exploring Buddhism for 20 years. Eventually, he found his way back to the restored gospel tradition, and today he finds himself integrating ideas from both in what we think are remarkable and important ways. If you'd like to hear Thomas's story in more detail, you can go back and listen to the multi-episode deep dive where he was interviewed by Bill Turnbull, starting in episode 15. And just in these past couple of weeks, Thomas has released a new online course called Gospel Meets Dharma. The course description says it this way, Gospel Meets Dharma represents a sacred encounter between Christianity and Buddhism, two traditions that have shaped and formed countless millions of minds and souls over the millennia. In this inner spiritual dialogue, the unique fruits of each path come into clear relief, while giving rise to a beauty that transcends and includes them both. We spoke to Thomas about the course and went deep in particular on topics like faith, doubt, contemplative prayer, and some of the gems of our traditions, as well as a thing or two that we might be able to learn from from those outside of our faith. If you're interested in buying the course, head to gospelmeetsdharma.com. Thomas is also offering a discount code for the launch, LAUNCH20, and just to specify, that's the word LAUNCH, L-A-U-N-C-H, in all caps, followed by the digits 2 and 0. We love speaking with Thomas, as we always do, and we really hope that you enjoy this conversation. Thomas McConkey, thank you so much for joining us. It's it's really really nice to be here with you in in the flesh. Totally, you guys too. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, I'm gonna start out with, I, I don't know if it's a hard question, but I'm gonna dive right into something that may that maybe naturally could come in the middle or even at the end, but I think mm-hmm. uh, really frames this. Um, a lot of our listeners will be familiar with your story, and we'll in the intro we'll point uh, to more extensive versions of your story that have that you've talked about on our on our podcast Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think it's fair to say you left you left the church as a teenager Mm -hmm. um later on to uh to return and the question that i want to ask is why did you come back Mm. let me give just give one more piece of framing here (laughs) i think the 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 sort of stereotypical like latter-day saint prodigal son story that's told in 15 seconds would be that you realized that there's a list of propositional truths yeah. that were correct and that compelled you to yeah. come back to those those yeah. correct beliefs yeah um i think your story maybe is is a little bit different than that and so i wanted to start with with that with that question yeah I'm going big <laughs> waste no time let's see you know in the context and spirit of this conversation because I think we have an intention to talk a little bit about gospel and dharma. Exactly. Dharma being, you know, my formation and the Buddhist tradition. Uh, you know, I I came back to like full activity in the church. I think out of a fullness of joy. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that was I really gave myself. I was. I was and have been and am very devoted to my Buddhist practice and life. And that helped cultivate a sense of freedom in me, a sense of compassion, a sense of fullness. And I learned in my own life that from a place of fullness, fullness tends to move from fullness to more fullness to more fullness. And it was really clear to me intuitively that there was more fullness to be had in our in this tradition and the restored gospel and i want to i want to be careful here because i know we can hear that different ways when i say mm-hmm. oh there's more fullness to be yeah. had it's like oh i did all this good stuff and it's awesome but now there's like all this stuff that's missing but it was more subtle than that to me i realized in a very direct way that without without my upbringing in buddhism i could not have appreciated the fullness of the gospel And I believe more and more the times we're in that people of whatever faith tradition or non-faith tradition they identify with, they'll realize that there is fullness beyond fullness beyond fullness available to them. If they're willing to really ground in what they stand for and believe in, but also be simultaneously open and vulnerable Mm. to the fullness that escapes our traditions. And let me like punch that it's my sense that a single tradition can't possibly express all of the possibilities open to the human family different traditions are genius 
and adept at expressing different kinds of qualities, different virtues, different truths. And I see a future where we're, we're actually interconnecting. It, it's um, not gathering people up so much under one tent as I see this kind mm. of fractal network, mm. networking of spirit and virtue. And we would say in our tradition, Christ's love. Yeah. So wow. maybe we'll have to unpack that response <laughs> yeah. a touch. Yeah. I loved how um, you talk about there was one, there was one, so we're, we're talking about this course gospel and meets Dharma. And there's this <laughs> moment where you talk about how coming back to Christianity or to the tradition of your childhood yeah. feels like coming home and like, you can feel your body like relax into it. And like, you just, it's yeah. effortless. And yeah. I love, I could, I could feel like the feelings you were describing. <clears throat> and, and I recognize that feeling of just like something being so familiar that coming home is really the only word yeah. for it. It just feels so it's just so easy. Yeah. But, but it made me think of, you know, people who are experiencing some sort of disillusionment or faith crisis or tension in their right. in that tradition from their childhood that right. those the resiliency of those images and ideas from their childhood may may like really cause trouble. Like they may yeah. be trying to like root those out and like yeah. it's frustrating that it like keeps resurfacing. And so I yeah. I wonder if you could just reframe that because it was I love this idea that like maybe that maybe it's beautiful that it's so primal that like it's so in you it will always be there and like is that right. maybe that's not a problem. Yeah, I mean these are should have come better prepared. These are, <laughs> these are complex questions, so I, I can't possibly speak to the fullness yeah. of you know that question or the prior question. Uh, but you know what comes to mind? I think about trauma and. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, literal trauma, but also like trauma is more of like a concept and a metaphor we can work with. In trauma, at least physiologically, the nervous system becomes overwhelmed. And in order to kind of protect the integrity of our wholeness and psyche from a particular injury, we have a very intelligent way of kind of cordoning it off. How do we like eliminate that part of our experience from mm -hmm. the wholeness that's functional and yeah, this is not my area of expertise but i think i understand it well enough to say that that that's beautiful and that it's it's an adaptive um style of just working with tremendous hardship in life but mm -hmm. the potential price tag on that is that we've lost a part of ourselves we've lost function so to that extent, I would say, yeah, if we can regain more function, mm -hmm. if we can recuperate, recover more of our inherent wholeness, then we're, in, we're, uh, we're recovering our inherent freedom at the same time. So there is a power in recovering that wholeness. And I think not always, but often it that recovering of wholeness comes through really deeply reckoning with the pain and the injury that we might have sustained through our upbringing, our formation and whatever tradition traditions we come from and to not make excuses for that, but also to let that pain move us into a deeper identity, a deeper mm -hmm. sense of wholeness that look, there's the, there's the relative identity that can be injured and harmed. And from my worldview, there's an absolute identity a true self that's beyond blemish it's beyond harm it's beyond sin even so how can we like stand in the integrity of this true self while not making any excuses about there was a relative harm done here mm -hmm. and yet i am so free i am so pure i am so redeemed that i can flow my loving compassion and service through this part of my life that was actually very painful for me at one time yeah. That's tremendous freedom, I think. And that's a little bit how I think about, you know, relaxing into the wholeness of everything we've been given. Wow. So <clears throat> are are you saying, I guess, that there is something about the the environment you, you say you say in the course that there's a primacy to the environment in which in which we grow up. Yeah. And that in particular, yeah. for each one of us, it sounds like you're saying it, in some way allows us to experience more fully that that freedom and and fullness and what what is it about that home environment as opposed to like why why couldn't it have been for you to the extent this is true yeah. that when you embraced buddhism yeah. for 15 20 years yeah. that 
you couldn't fully embrace the fullness and, and freedom that may have been available to you? The freedom and fullness in the Latter-day Saint tradition? No. I want to make sure I understand that. No. Fr oh, free right, from... I, I just mean freedom and fullness as as general concepts that can apply to yeah. an individual. Or is that, not, is that a broken paradigm? Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, let me see here. Because I want to go slow here and I don't want to paint too broad a stroke. Yeah. Because... I, I can imagine listeners would hear potentially like, no, I did leave that tradition. It was mm -hmm. harmful. I'm really happy in X tradition now. I've found something that works. Don't tell me I need to go back there. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I have a lot of respect for that. So I, I don't want to kind of make my personal experience the template of this is how healthy right. spirituality unfolds. And yet I do like make a claim in the course and in my work that there is a primacy to like our native tongue is mm -hmm. the kind of metaphor mm -hmm. I use. Yeah. There's something it's like when we speak our native tongue, it's invisible. It's like I, I'm not even aware that right. I'm using language right now. Right. I'm just being a human. Yep. And there's something liberating about that potentially. I ran up against this in my Buddhist training where um, my teachers would refer to the Kuan Yin, Kanzian, Bodhisattva, uh, that we could, uh, well, you should, I mean, get the course, listen to the <laughs> course, but if I were to try to shrink it down, I mean, Kanzian is the embodiment of compassionate service in, you know, some schools of Buddhism. So I, I'm hearing it. I'm digging it. I'm on board. Like I'm, I'm hearing the concepts. I'm getting to know this Kanzian figure. And yet it took me like a good decade before I realized like it's, it's not singing to me the same way Jesus sang to me as a child. And again, wow. be, being careful here, I'm not saying people need to go to Jesus. That would be far too crude, like mm -hmm. a generalization to make. But I do think there's value in like being honest with ourselves, like what sings to me? And mm -hmm. also what areas of my life have I cordoned off because I had a bad experience back then, I was harmed then. And yet in, in kind of siloing it off, I lose out on a lot of the power and the flow and the gifts of that part of myself. So it's, it's subtle to un unpack, I don't know if it makes for good yeah. radio i'm trying to like really entertain no, yeah, no, <laughs> I, totally really I don't yeah. want to bog exactly. us down but but yeah. i want to like unpack it slowly because right. oh, there's think, so many misunderstandings i I, I i don't i, I hopefully it's good radio i think because <laughs> to me it's a it's a really essential question i think a lot of people in their in their faith journeys you know when uh you know a previously held belief gets challenged or seriously challenged or broken right there's often that um you know, it, it, within a, a person that experiences that, there arises a feeling of, well, I can, like, like you're saying, there, I'm going to cordon this off completely. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to separate myself. Right. And so, I think it is a really valid question because this is something I've asked myself. Like, is there something about the Latter Day Saint tradition that <clears throat> calls me to it simply because I am a Latter Day Saint? You know, right. and I always, and I always have been. Right. You know, as opposed right. to uh, the same way that Catholicism or, or Buddhism or uh, Islam may call to people that that's the, that uh, hold those as their own home environments. I love what you're saying. Like, let me let me just elaborate on that a little bit. So I often hear, you know, this question about identity and like mm -hmm. what we give ourselves to. And if we were raised Latter Day Saint then in some circles, not all, but in some circles, it's like a strike against you. It's like, oh, that's just what you were given. That's all you know. Right. Right. And so yep. it's like, well, then you you have a responsibility actually to really get out there and see like what's on offer other than your tradition, which of course you're comfortable there. That's where you've always been comfortable. Mm -hmm. There's some truth to that. I, I would agree that like, yeah, there is something that humanizes us by becoming more open and vulnerable to a plurality of traditions. But I think where the critics maybe get it wrong or they underemphasize it is the opposite truth. How can I say the opposite truth? Um, it's something like, yes, I was born a Latter-day Saint and therefore I have a responsibility to inhabit that tradition. It's the opposite truth that doesn't get emphasized. I have a responsibility because I'm a native speaker, because the power of the tradition and my ancestry throws, flows through me, 
who else can improve the tradition and help it regenerate and claim its fullness if not me? Mm -hmm. The cultural critics miss that side of the equation and I, I feel the lack of that and I wanna stand in that. Yeah. So it's both. Thank you. Paul, That's really that. powerful, yeah. I wonder if you would talk about your experience at the Thomas, uh, Father Thomas Keating's memorial because oh, yeah. I think that the next question for me is, you know, why, what, like, what are you missing if you don't, if you're not on the, if you're not deep into one thing? Because in yeah. a lot of ways, it feels easier to, 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 um, you know, choose what's beautiful and life giving and, and throw away the rest. Right. And I think maybe there's a point where that's actually really healthy, like having yes. that kind of freedom to say, this doesn't serve me <clears throat> now, but, but you have this insight and I'd love for you to talk about it and just, and what is the difference between choosing what's powerful and life-giving yeah. versus, you know, maintaining a polite distance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's my state of mind this morning or if it's just you two coming with like the most sophisticated <laughs> questions I've ever come up against, but that's, that's just the question itself is really profound. And, uh, what it brings up for me is kind of an experience of like Buddhist meditation or mindfulness, which I talk about a lot in the course, but there, there's a truth. There's a principle that we get really familiar with. If we sit still for a long period of time, you know, like, days and weeks and months and years, we just cultivate stillness in our lives. We learn really deeply that in a given moment, there's experience happening. And some of it I like and some of it I don't. Now, I know all of us like know that anyway, but if we really take a close look at it, we get really intimate with our avoidant um, <laughs> yeah. techniques, like our avoidant yeah. strategies. So what do I do when I don't want to feel what life is like serving up for me? I observe my avoidance strategies and I realize that if if every time I f try to avoid feeling something I don't want to feel, my meditation practice will become not only self-limiting but toxic. So I'm sitting still and I don't tell myself this. I don't admit it to myself. It's like I'm meditating because I believe it will make me feel good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm meditating because I believe it will make me a happy, free, spiritual person. People will like me more. I might even like become more successful in my career. Da, da, da. You know, we have these agendas, <laughs> yeah. but then when life just says, no, you're nailed to a cross, right? To switch metaphors here. No, like this is, this is the cup and it's really, really bitter. Mm -hmm. And that's like really where the reckoning comes. It's like, okay, this is not what I signed up for. But then something deeper in us, something potentially that the lover of truth in us says, oh, like the bitter cup, like I was really hoping this wouldn't come to me right now, but somehow I, I, I like smell redemption here. Like there's something in it for me. Right. So we learn in our, you know, in our meditation practice in life to go into like what we would have rejected. Mm hmm back to the question right like why not in in so we're, that's the meditation kind of analogy we go back to your question about tradition why not like in a world where like i can download the latest talk from like the sufi who's trending in the whole western world man sufism's amazing they're all about meditating on the heart and oh this room hafez Rumi, look at these poets i'm just going to be a sufi for a while mm -hmm. and then i even like join a little sufi circle and i do my chanting and my zikr and i'm all into it and then i'm there long enough that oh, that guy kind of bugs me <laughs> you know like if we stay anywhere long enough that tradition is going to disturb us because we're mm. going to be up against our humanity again. And there's a danger, I think, in our generation of like honeymooning indefinitely. Wow. And the moment this honeymoon is started, it's like, oh, our, our 20 days in Acapulco are coming to an end. I'm going to go to Switzerland now. <laughs> and we, we can do that for a long time, but it becomes very self-limiting because, it, and this, is, this might be a long-winded way to respond to your question, but I feel deeply about it we realize that that whole way of living out our avoidant strategies in life is self-limiting. If we don't fully give ourselves to any tradition, we will all will be doing like it's spiritual entertainment. We'll be entertaining wow. ourselves and like cutting bait before anything real happens. So why not be more choiceful about, okay, like warts and all, I love this community. I'm going to stick around, you know, 
that's wow. that's part of what I think's on the line. And it's t- I'm learning those lessons. I'm learning about how my commitments to my Latter Day Saint faith, uh, my Buddhist faith. Yeah. I, I I haven't answered these questions, but I'm speaking from a place of like the danger of spiritual dilettantism and mm-hmm. like a perennial shopping spree for the latest spiritual teaching. Yeah. And what sells less and what's less sexy is like, no, you got to stay with the tradition that's wounded you, that continues to offend you, because that's the very humanity we're trying to redeem. How can you redeem humanity but in the trenches? Yeah. I I wonder, though, like, I I just feel like the I imagine listeners saying, but, you know, if you're going to go deep somewhere, like it better be in the right place, like pick the best. Yeah. Like pick the best traditions to grow. Like there must be some objective truth. <clears throat> and so pick the best spot and then go deep there. And so right. maybe they don't chew, maybe they don't want to cut bait and they don't want to <clears throat> shop, but they're out of, you know, real integrity. They're searching for the best thing. So yeah. do you feel like it's the depth that matters? Yeah, that's tricky. No, I, I, I feel that question in my own life and I hear that from people I practice with. Um, let me invoke faith and trust and sincerity and maybe whatever other sponsors will help <laughs> answer this question but you know faith trust sincerity when we're really sincere in our seeking uh there's there's a way in which way leads to way mm-hmm. i think i think the perfect which is an ideal abstraction can very easily become an enemy of the good so if i'm faithful I'm curious what's coming up here, actually. <laughs> no, I mean, genuinely, what a, whatever I'm saying is boring at this point. Like, what does no, that mean No, I think you? I always cry when something feels very true. And like, well, hey. I think that's a good way to put it. Like, the the perfect gets in the way of what's good, you know? And it, you, yeah. it makes me think of actually like of screw tape letters. Mm-hmm. You know, like if we can just stay so distracted and busy, like searching for the best thing, right. even though it's such a good intention, right. like it gets in the way of so much growth. It's another avoidant strategy, actually. It's It masquerades yeah. as, no, I'm like, I really want to find the truth and give myself to the truth. But often upon investigation, we realize that has become an excuse for 50 years to not just give myself to the messy unknowing right. of my life. Right. Yeah. So there's something there. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about how we how we communicate these ideas um, to one another. You you um, specifically you talk about the difference between interfaith dialogue and inner spiritual dialogue, yeah. and I'd love for you to like explore that a little bit because yeah. I've always I, I've always considered interfaith dialogue to be a real positive, which I think it is, and I, I don't think you're, I don't think you're disputing that at all. I agree. Um, but I felt like there was another level to it that I'd never thought about. If you wouldn't mind yeah. talking about that a bit. Yeah, no, thank you. I agree. I do sustain, affirm, revere all interfaith efforts. Um, and in a tradition of restoration, the question is like, what greater fullness will be restored? I mean, it took humanity thousands of years to like, get to the point where we would give a damn about having an interfaith dialogue. Yeah. That's, that's an achievement of evolution. It's achievement, an achievement <laughs> yeah, of spirit. Yeah. So let's like, you know, honor that. And I think the potential limitation, one of the limitations I see is, uh, I, I think of William Wordsworth's quote, I think he, he, he says, we murder to dissect. And like in the context, it means like part of the architecture of interfaith work is like, oh, we're going to like tease out what do you believe? Mm -hmm. What do you believe? What are your icons, your characters, your texts? We're actually dismantling the (laughs) tradition in order to make it like relatable at all, (laughs) right? It's like, you know, you Mm -hmm. are so other to me, like, tell me what you believe, tell me like, let's break it down. And then I end up like understanding, do I? understand you i think i understand you but only in parts only in bits only in sections yeah vivisection right dissection so what would a deeper commitment look like and that's where father thomas keating talked about inner spiritual dialogue know the tradition from the inside it's not about abstracting a truth out of it it's like like, take up the practice if you want to know sufism become a Sufi. I mean, I don't mean you have to take hand and become a card carrying member. I mean, like feel the ritual, feel the poetry, feel the scripture and the community from the inside so that you're not dissecting it anymore and rendering it, you know, dead. Yeah. Essentially it's, it's, um, it's a high bar. Yeah. I feel like there, there's 
a potential uh, listener, including myself, you know, when I first heard about this course, that here's the even the name of the course, Gospel Meets Dharma, and right. expects maybe what you're describing. It's like, well, here's where, you know, Christianity <laughs> or Latter Day Saintism, you know, really is the same thing as mm -hmm. as Buddhism, you know, right. or on, on a belief on a belief level. But it seems like you very intentionally tried to do something different. I hope I left you uncomfortable. Uh, so much so that like the discomfort by the end of the, I'm not doing a good job at selling the course. But at this point, <laughs> it was so like, oh. uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, that was very intentional. I wanted to preserve attention. Like we cannot reduce one tradition to another. It's not the all roads lead to Rome kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's like, I'm going to actually have to risk myself at some of the deepest levels. If I want to understand the fullness of, part of God's revelation to the human family. Yeah. It's risky business. Yeah. It enlivens me. I feel strongly about it, obviously. I, otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you two about it right yeah. now. But I've found it it has redeemed my Christian faith to do mm. this, to really, I, I surrendered myself to the Dharma at a young age. And it took me so deep in my own experience that by the time I got to who knows the center of it, it's like there was nothing left of me. I didn't know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. And yet that opened me up to a much greater measure of truth in my native tradition, right, of Christianity yeah. and the restored gospel. So I, I'm an advocate of this approach because I've seen how powerfully it can convert a heart. But of course, people have to decide, like, how much do I want to risk myself? It, what I'm saying is disputable. People could easily disagree with it rightfully so, and keep doing exactly what they're doing in their life of faith. And that would be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for those who like hear the intent of my heart, I, I believe there's a path here that's really significant that I hope more people will adopt because I believe it's part of, you know, what we're tasked with in the restoration Yeah. to, to risk more for each other. Yeah. I love yeah. how you say that your Buddhism and Christianity activate each other. Yes. And and there were a lot of times where you would bring up terms in the course that seemed like they would be intention, like no self versus divine nature, right. or even just like the different ways of defining faith. So when you, with all that in mind, like, right. are, is it is it the fact that you're having to navigate these two ideas that are intention that is causing this growth? Or, you know, how what do you mean by they're complementing each other? Like, because sometimes they seem a little bit mutually exclusive, like they seem like they're, they're teaching sort of like opposite ideas or is it that like right. you're having to wrestle and and just decide what you think because now there's this there's more freedom right or what you know what do you what do you mean by how are they complementing each other well let me, yeah thank you let me zoom out and say that a, a deep intention i had in creating this material gospel meets dharma is to not try to tell people like, hey, you should know more about Buddhism. And that would have been an easy play because like lots of people I meet are like, oh, I want to learn Buddhist meditation. Totally. But yeah, like I could sit you could here like, and, like ride the trend a I little bit. I could sell yeah. Buddhism to people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what feels, a, what has more integrity to me is to try to like walk my talk and I'm trying to walk my talk better every day of my life. But the talk is like, okay, interspiritual dialogue how can i engage in this very course in gospel meets dharma in an interspiritual dialogue where i'm willing to inhabit the inside of christianity and really know it in its integrity and in buddhism and not try to reduce one to the other mm -hmm. and certainly not make one about like well clearly christianity is the more powerful tradition clearly without christ you guys are in trouble like that feels like a reductionism of the mm -hmm. majesty of a whole tradition that has shaped millions, countless millions of hearts and minds that I wasn't willing to engage in. So like that, t yes, that tension for whatever reason has exercised me in my whole spiritual mm -hmm. life. And actually having paid attention to that exercising, it's like, no, there's something, it's not just an accident here. There's, there's something for all of us, whether people are into gospel or Dharma, it's the it's just the practice of holding these traditions mm. up to one another deeply it, it reorganizes us it opens us up it, it gives birth to a new creature in a way that i, I just wouldn't have anticipated mm. and now yeah. i'm kind of evangelizing it like i think it yeah speaking of uh of... speaking of evangelism what um <laughs> what implications does all of this have for missionary work 
especially in the Latter-day Saint tradition. Yeah. This is a topic. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good, no, I did, I'm just delighted with you, dude. So it's amazing. No, it's a, my heart just feels full. Yeah. I feel mad. I feel like we're in the difficulty of the questions. These are really difficult, thoughtful questions you're yeah. putting out there that I don't know. I think a lot of people- but What a great I mean, question. I'll, I'll, I think a lot of people are thinking about this. I'm thinking, yeah. I mean, my, when I went out as a 19 year old missionary, it was definitely with the purpose of, um, you know, it, of imposing in in some sense, maybe that's too harsh a word, but sure. my list of beliefs on on other people. Right. Um, there was very, uh, I mean, and and to give myself and all missionaries from my era, you know, a little bit of credit. Yeah. A lot of that was uh, all of that was done, you know, with the best of intent, of and course. there was a lot of inner spiritual work that was being done too. We weren't just talking beliefs; like totally. we were trying to feel something together for sure. Um, yeah, but I think a lot of a lot of people are wondering what the next 10, 20, 30 years of missionary work look like in the church, because it's, yeah, no. I, you could argue that that's, that's not as working as well as it once did. Yeah. I um, think a lot of people who know the numbers well yeah. might say something. Yeah. Like and I think there's a growing sense that we have, we have more to learn potentially than we, than we thought we did from, from others in other right. traditions. Yes. I'm, I'm just really moved by the question. Cause I, I deeply care about the power of the restored gospel spreading like holy fire across the planet mm -hmm. and i believe the missionary force we have is one of our greatest tools to help that happen mm -hmm. and to your point and your question yeah how could it be even more powerful and effective as a program and an intention than it already is mm -hmm. so that the question is really moving to me i just want to like take a full pause on that And what what comes to my heart, and I'd be curious to hear from both of you on this, but I've found, so I've been, I've been teaching gospel and dharma full time now for about 10 years. I've sat with just a lot of students and a lot of groups and a lot of places and like a principle I've found to be true. There's always an active and a passive element. There's always a giving and a receiving and a, a a kind of spiritual maturity that I've found to be lacking in myself and in others who struggle with this is the capacity to receive a teaching. Mm -hmm. So like we'll get a visitor from another spiritual community and they'll come in or, or I'll be a visitor in a, another spiritual community and I'll be like, you know, listening to the teacher and like, I just can't help myself. My mind's like, oh, that teacher's better than this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm so mm -hmm. invested in the rightness of my teacher, my lineage, my tradition, that I like the moment I'm exposed to another person, like they literally can't give me their gifts because I won't wow. receive them. So I imagine like a missionary force, like what if, what if we were all like as Latter-day Saints, what if we were 1% like more receptive to like this like divine exchange of giving and receiving so that like the people we're sharing our gifts with it's actually kinesthetically felt. Maybe they don't consciously know it, but they have this experience like, man, when I'm around the Latter-day Saints, I feel really received. I feel like what I love the very most, they love it right with me because they're on the inside of my experience. They're not at a distance saying like, oh, you believe that? Let me show you what we read here. Here's a book we read. It's like, I'm, like as a Latter-day Saint, I'm so invested in what's precious to you Rumi, I, I don't have the exact words I've quoted. I mentioned Rumi earlier. I don't know why the Sufis are just in my field this <laughs> morning, but Rumi writes this great poem and it's about a wise man who needs to like dole out his inheritance to his sons. And he decides to like uh, have, he has a competition to see who's the wisest. And so he asks each son, so like, how do you discern a wise man? And like, they all give their answers and they're fine answers. But the last one, I'm so moved by this. I don't even know if I can say it without breaking up. But the last, <clears throat> the last son, he says, I, I know when a man is wise for what comes out of my mouth. Like not, I don't know a man's wise because of what they say. I know a man's wise. I know a woman's wise. I know a person's wise because of what comes out of my mouth in their presence. Wow. And then he goes on to say it's, it's like a powerful right arm of God sweeping down across the earth when I'm in the presence of wisdom. So it's this quality of like if our, 
if as we're all missionaries, right? We're all sharing the love and truth we, we've been given by grace. Um, if I could be that presence to a Buddhist, to a Muslim, to a Hindu, to like whatever of God's children and their experience, they don't know that Latter-day Saints are wise and correct in their faith because of what we're saying to them as missionaries. It's like what they're able to say in our presence opens up a whole new vista of truth and revelation to them. It's, it's like the opposite side of proselyting that maybe we haven't focused on yeah. as much up till now. Wow, I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. And I just keep thinking of that phrase you used at the beginning, the fullness into fullness into fullness. Yeah. Like it, I, it seems like that is maybe where we can, you know, pay some attention. That are we, are we serving missions right now from this place of lack? That like we need, we need baptisms and we need right. numbers and we like we. It is like this place of scarcity. And I love the idea. Like, what if we went out with this fullness? Right. Without you know, we didn't need anything. There was nothing to make up for. Or, you know, no empty boxes to check. It's yeah, just like we have, we have all fullness. That's brilliant. I love that. And it reminds me, I, I talk in the course of Father William Johnston, who was, he was an innovator. He's a pioneer uh, in this area of, you know, bi-directional missionary work. And he, you know, he was a Jesuit, he was a Jesuit of the Catholic tradition. And, you know, before long in Japan, he was sitting Zazen meditation in the Zen temples with the monks. And it it made him a more powerful missionary to the Japanese people. I I know I haven't spoken directly to you know the people that William Johnston worked with in Japan. Well, one one became my teacher, <laughs> but I, I just know in faith that uh, the people of Japan got to know Christ better as a result of him like going deep into their own sacred rites yeah. and temples to like you know yeah honor them in that way. Yeah. One thing I think we do really well as in our missionary program and as Latter-day Saints generally is, um, is serve others like in a really tangible way, right? Yeah. Like we, we tend to get out there and, and do hard stuff on behalf yeah. of other people. Yeah. Um, often I think with truly altruistic intent, you know, yeah. um, you share sort of a funny experience that you had talking to a teacher about that when you were learning to to really meditate and and just oh, sit. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think um, I know what one you're talking about. Would you, would you? Well, why don't you just take a guess at which one? <laughs> is it is it the one like the 23 and yes, a half hour yes, story? Yes. Yeah. Can you share that? Well, I was really torn up because like you know I was 18 years old. I was working with my first Buddhist teacher, and it it was unexpected to me. I didn't realize it would be so challenging. But I found that like in my my practice where I'm just sitting still and meditating for however long, 30 minutes, an hour a day just all these voices coming up nagging at me saying like you're wasting your life you're wasting your time from a religious point of view it's much more holy efficacious mm -hmm. fill in the blank to like go serve people than to sit there in stillness yeah and so after like just being tormented by these demons on my cushion i came to them i'm like this is what i'm struggling with i have a really hard time sitting still because i have this belief that it's better to go serve and he <laughs> it's hard to i'll try to channel him but it was like this kind of timeless zen master wisdom he just and then he kind of looked at me out of the corner of his eye he said sit for a half hour serve the other 23 and a half hours boom and like a good Zen master just like took out that sword of discernment and just slashed yeah. through everything that was tripping me up and it it really taught me in a deep way how interpenetrating yeah. how interdependent the paths of stillness and service are yeah and actually the quality of my service over time uh became better just by my willingness to kind of be in my own stillness mm. right how, how so yeah. the, qual the quality the quality in the sense that your motivation had changed or my whole being had changed yeah like if we serve out of a sense of like i should serve Mm -hmm. yeah that's fine like to your point like in the worst of scenarios i should serve and i'm going to go serve i think good things come from that yeah people might take me to task on that but even service with not the best motives ends up bearing its own kind of fruit in ways we can't totally understand but how much more so if i'm willing to sit with my own disturbance my own sense of lack my own insecurities my own judgments about myself and humanity if if even some of that can be cleaned up 
and even 2% more the next time I serve somebody, it's coming from a place of presence yeah. mm. and fullness. Yeah. You know, they, they receive the quality of that presence and fullness that maybe wasn't there before. So we need both. Yeah. Right? We need both paths. Yeah, I love that. I want to make sure that we spend a little bit of time on <laughs> this concept of faith. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we've talked so much about doubt in our own tradition and in Christianity broadly. I think doubt is like this very threatening word. And so I loved hearing how I loved hearing you talk about faith and Buddhism and because it wasn't even a defense of doubt. It was just like it was it, it's like everything turned upside down and you didn't have to defend it. It was like it was such a beautiful mm. way to to for me, it felt like a redefinition of faith, kind of. So, yeah. so could you talk about, you know, how you, how you, um, di how you see it differently, you know, in Christianity and in Buddhism? I, there was one part that just it made me laugh out loud when you said, "When I think of the Christian way of defining doubt, I feel like I have to like go do some yoga or something because it oh, feels yeah, like very it's like a out. yeah." yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of people <laughs> will relate to that, and so I would love for you to define, or just you know, explain how how. If you were, if if Buddhism especially was your mother tongue, like how would you think of faith? Yeah, oh, cool. That thank you for serving it to me in a way that I can relax. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I can. <laughs> yeah, how would I respond to it then? Hmm. Faith and doubt. Well, for starters, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, particularly Zen, we don't regard faith and doubt as actually two separate things. Mm -hmm. That could lead down a mystifying non-dual path if I indulge that, but let me just say it, that like what if faith and doubt are actually two sides of the same coin? And in that sense, like doubt as an expression of faith. For example, if I have sincere doubt, I'm exercising humility in my own finiteness how is that not faith right faith when like faith in the sense that we often understand that um it can calcify and become crusty and actually serve to defend us against greater revelation and transformation yeah so doubt in a buddhist sense is like this necessary countervailing force counterpart that is continually reminding us like you don't actually, well, let me put it in the form of a question. Are you sure about that? Are you sure you know what you know, right? And that, when we hear that as Latter-day Saints, the mistake I think we make is then we do the same thing with doubt that we do with faith. We calcify the doubt. Right. And so we, path, we say like, oh, that's a bad thing because if you just doubt, then you're just doubting. But no, like doubt and faith are much more fluid and free-flowing than that. Doubt in its healthy expression even doubts itself. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes some time to feel into that subtlety, but I sense you too resonating that if I doubt even the quality of my own doubt, I doubt that I know something. I doubt that I don't know something. I'm just completely, it's, it's another way of saying beginner's mind. Mm. It's another way of saying, if I sincerely doubt, I'm actually becoming as a child who can enter the kingdom. Yeah. Wow. That's where the traditions start to like, come very closely together on yeah. that point. Yeah. In, in the course, you use the terms light some faith and, and dark some faith. Christian terms, yeah. Yeah. Could you could you define those? Well, yeah. I mean, without oversimplifying, the dark some faith is doubt. Yeah. The dark some faith is what it, it pulls away all of the constructs, all of the outworn ideas, all of the beliefs I have that are actually not life-giving, but they're life-negating. And those beliefs are like getting between me and greater knowledge of Christ. That's the darksome faith. Yeah. Yeah. That I, maybe sometimes gets short shrift in our yeah. language. I think, I think early in my own or earlier in my own uh, faith journey, like immediately post what you might call faith crisis, I, at least within a couple of years, like I started to really embrace darksome faith, mm -hmm. like as, in the sense that I think uh, for a while it, I was all about, all about uncertainty and not, and not knowing. Yeah. Um, and there was almost a pride to it yep. in the sense, like, yeah. I don't know anything and neither like, I'll you. let you figure this out, but neither do you, you know? Right. And if you think you know something, wow. Well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you were to speak to me, um, 
in that in that stage in that in that mentality well i guess a the question might be would you want to pull me out of that and if, if so yes. how would how would you do so it's a great question well like and again this is uh this is an experience that's more elaborated on in Buddhism, but to, to really doubt in a way that is faithful, we have to lose our mind. We have to, li we have to lose our mind. So like if I were, you know, counseling with that Tim of however many years ago, who just confesses that, oh yeah, I'm so identified with doubt now that when someone tells me to have faith, I secretly feel superior to them because mm -hmm. I know that the deeper truth is like, you don't know anything. Like, mm -hmm. how can we actually even, like, let that go so that the, the mind and the heart just open up into a state of, like, it becomes, like, if I can put it into words, words are limiting, but it's something like, oh, I, you know, I love, like, the, I love doubt. I, I love what this is opening up in my spiritual life. And this person loves knowing and, like, huh, that's weird. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Like, it, mm. it's, like, just... It's doubting our own capacity to know yeah. another person. It makes us a lot judge a lot less judgmental yeah. Yeah. for starters. So it's it's again we fixate the doubt. We do this. We relate to Definitely. doubt the same way we relate to faith. But how could they both become so fluid that like you know in one moment we can't tell the difference between faith or doubt because they're both expressions of absolute openness and a converted yeah. heart. Yeah, I think that's what the teaching is bringing us to. I, I apologize for being so mundane in my thinking here, and I'm I always I always sort of go I here. I need some <laughs> mundaneness. You guys have been like crushing me with the I, high level like when you questions. when you say that like I'm I'm resonating with it, and you know I want to sort of take that additional journey, and I I feel like you know to some extent like from the point that we were talking about, yeah. but like how do I do that? Right. Um, in like practical steps, what am I doing with my body? What am I doing with my mind? Yeah, well, my great, heart that gets me there. Great question. You know, like whether we're training Buddhist meditation or Christian contemplation, you know, the, the exercises, the spiritual practices that these traditions offer us, it, again, I'm oversimplifying here. These are experiences that are best lived and cultivated and explored endlessly. But, I, you know, like you take a fist and it's this quality mm. of like opening. Mm. And I, again, let's not dualize this. I'm not saying fist bad, open palm good. But like the practice of contemplative prayer or Buddhist meditation, it's helping us bring greater awareness to like when I am experiencing solidity, the solidity of like a body, the solidity of an opinion and a belief system. And by by learning how to let these things relax moment to moment, I'm, I'm making the whole system more transparent to itself so that when I am open, I'm aware that I'm open and I'm permeable and I'm mm -hmm. vulnerable. I can be taught. When I can be taught, wow. people around me like to be around me because they can share their truths more mm -hmm. fully, like we mentioned earlier. In the, in the Sufi rendition. Not only that, but I get to have my cake and eat it too because the fullness, the, the fist is actually a somethingness. It's that I have uniqueness. I have personhood. I take this to be true. Not because it has to be, not because I have a death grip on what needs to be true, but because I, wow. I choose to take this to be true. It, it's, it's genuine mm. agency. Yeah. And I think the traditions have their ways of helping train that freedom, that spontaneity, that that fluidity into our beings. I yeah. feel like that is so important. I, I just I've had like countless conversations and I've experienced this too, where where you feel like, you know, when something starts deconstructing, you feel like you have to deconstruct all the way. You know, like yes. it, it dominoes fall it and runs pretty away soon, with itself. Right. And yes. then pretty soon you're you're deconstructing yes. your mo like your most sacred, like very personal experiences and yes. like ripping that out. Like you're yes. deciding like I can't have this yes. anymore. You know? So intuitive. <clears throat> That's exactly what I'm pointing to. And I've worked with so many people in this process where like they open up the doubt because they have an intuition, I think a genuine yeah. spiritual intuition. Yeah. Like, no, I, I'm big enough to doubt. It's okay if I doubt. My parents told me not to, but we do things differently in this <laughs> yeah. generation. Yeah, exactly. we, we set out on that path with mm -hmm. all the best intentions, and then it just runs away with itself Yeah, out of the habit of what we've been doing our whole lives. So if we can recognize that moment of opportunity where like the doubt actually, in the depths of the doubt, it, it, yeah. it re-congeals into a whole new 
belief that we would have never like, oh, like there it is, like my bedrock. Mm -hmm. Right. We we find our deepest faith in our deepest doubt. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. I can feel like my <laughs> my like this is just my Latter Day Saint roots. Like I want uh, you know, like in personal progress. When I was in Young Women's, we'd have you know, like here's your goal, and then you have three steps, and it would take three weeks, and like here's the things you're gonna do to yeah <laughs> to do to get to this point. Yeah. And I can feel that. Like I want I want to know exactly what it looks like and how to get there, and I want you know like steps and goals and stuff. And 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 I feel like we still kind of teach that in 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 our tradition that you know the goal is to have like the the fist to have like solid knowledge, and like if you're not you don't have that yet, like that's the direction you're you're trying to go right. you know and so i is this one of those cases where like these two ideas are sort of conflicting like is this a place <laughs> where buddhism could be healing for our community because it seems like i can't i can't see how both of these how you could be trying to do both right you know yeah i don't know <laughs> good answer <laughs> it's a beautiful question it's a really beautiful question that i want to live into with you yeah yeah, that's hard. I think I think that's hard. I think we have a lot of like, it's easy to attach your identity to the fist. Yeah, you know, to attach at least in our in in our kind of community where we're meeting and we're expressing these these lists of. I, I right. love how you say you talk about how sometimes we confuse scaffolding with the ultimate. Yeah, and I think occasionally we can turn you know a fast and testimony meeting into this this like profession of scaffolding and like and you and it can really it can really become part of who you are like what can you can you profess all of the same things and like how much do you really believe today and right. i think that can be a really like threatening experience and yeah. so i like the, yeah. this idea that like maybe the goal isn't to get to that really solid yeah you know list of very specific beliefs imagine i'm just like kind of going in this direction with you imagine a testimony meeting where for whatever reason just it's who showed up that day it's who the spirit moved to speak you hear almost exclusively an expression of people standing up and saying you know i thought i was really sure about this for a long time and now i don't know how i see it and you like kind of feel that rush through them like huh and then oh. someone else stands up like you know what i knew this was true five minutes ago and now i don't know what i know you can imagine after an hour of that, like the the quality in the room is different than when 50 people stand yeah. up one after another and say, this is true, this is true, this is true. And it's not that one's right and the other's wrong. It's There's a polarity here. There is, uh, there's truth that can be discovered in the proof of opposites, you know, to put mm -hmm. it in Joseph Smith's words. So, yeah, I, I hope as Latter-day oh. Saints we can recover more of that energy and that freedom that comes through just the simple act of like i don't know mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah yeah i love that you um you used the term a few minutes ago contemplative prayer yeah um not all our listeners may be familiar with that you, yeah you give a meditation in the course on contemplative prayer i wonder if we could give a gift to our listeners right now who aren't familiar with it but yeah. but maybe heard that term and it resonated and they kind of thought or were moved <clears throat> to think you know i want that that sounds interesting i want to try that yeah. What is what is contemplative prayer and how does how does one just take the first step on that on that path? Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of words, meditation, mindfulness, contemplation. There, mm -hmm. there are words and, you know, for non-experts, they sound like they're all pointing to something similar. Um, I'm, I'm really I try to be really conscientious about when I say which one and in this case contemplative prayer um, contemplation points to a very particular kind of awareness or attitude that we cultivate in the presence of God in the Christian tradition and uh, contempl contemplation or what Father Thomas Keating and his colleagues developed are just centering prayer. Mm. Many people have heard of centering prayer, which is really a practice designed to help us enter contemplation. Uh, contemplation is an experience that can't be put into words, but here I go. It's, it's, it's a trust so deep in God that I completely open myself to God's influence and presence. 
And that influence and presence runs so deep that I can't even know through my own human faculties what God is, what kind of work God's doing with me. Mm. Let me let me pause here because it's unique to the Christian tradition. It's powerful and it's very different than the Buddhist approach, I might say. But it's one thing to say like, oh, I'm going to be still and it's time to just like let go and let God let Jesus take the wheel, my <laughs> wife, my wife likes to say. Um, and, and if I do that, if I, if I let God in, then God is going to heal my wounds and redeem my humanity and help me forgive this person. And we, there goes our agenda mm -hmm. again. And what's, what's just radically vulnerable about contemplation as a Christian is that I, I trust the, the, the power and the activity of the divine so fully that it's like I, I give away the keys to my house and all my treasure chests and everything I hold most precious and I don't even ask a question about it. Like mm -hmm. the divine is working on such a deep level in us that we can't even know what's happening. It, it's in uh, Thomas Keating's words, it's too subtle for any human faculty to perceive. So how do we say yes to something that we, we don't even know what we're saying yes to? That's true faith. Yeah. Right? And uh, I can't remember if I talk about this in the course. It's a, I talk about a lot of stuff in the course, but St. John of the Cross renders it so poetically. He says, pure faith is a ray of darkness to the soul. Yeah. We're used to the ray of light. I love light. Right. I love knowing stuff. I love having my house in order. The, the ray of darkness is the, the faith is so pure and so dark. I, I, I know nothing but absolute trust to God's presence and God's will. And to whatever extent that God gifts us with the grace of contemplation, we find ourselves, you know, walking the world. Um, how can I say it? It, it helps us put into perspective. Um, I, the words totally fall short here. Paul says that, you know, he, you know, in the New Testament, it's not I who live, but Christ lives in me. The gift of contemplation is to be situated, to see ourselves situated in the scheme of things, how mm. ultimately infinite we are and how ultimately nothing we are simultaneously. And it kind of changes the way we move, it changes yeah. our motivations at the deepest level. I'm curious how how practices like fasting and petitionary prayer yeah. can still fit in yeah. like that tastes so good. I, I that feels yeah. so right. Like I can feel that that's like such a deep faith and it feels so much more <clears throat> expansive than, than needing something to happen so much. And you try to convince yourself you believe it enough and yeah. beg and plead. And like, you feel like, you know, you're, you're begging God to change a situation for you. Like this feels better than this feels more peaceful than that yeah. just a deeper trust that maybe yeah. it will be different totally but how does like fasting and, and petitionary prayer fit fit into this idea of contemplation yeah awesome question i mean to me again if we look at like i i tend to see things i think we're taught to see things in a way in terms of opposites mm -hmm. in the restored gospel so i'm back to this like closed fist open palm again like what i just described contemplation well it gets paradoxical to talk about but there, there's, there's a quality, a spiritual capacity we can cultivate of surrender. And then there's a spiritual capacity we can cultivate of agency. And like the agency, the exercise of will and surrender, they turn out to like not be different in the end. So in some moments, what my yeah. spiritual life is calling for is a deeper faith, like a total letting go. And then petitionary prayer, having been graced by contemplation and God's will and presence, I am actually more guided to offer a petitionary prayer on this person, these people's behalf. So it, I've found um, in my meager little prayer life that the, the contemplation sharpens the petition. It's like, it's like with my whole being, like, no, I'm serious, God, I am asking for this right now. And there's a power in undividedness, you know, wow. versus the superficial, like, you know, please bless that we can get home safely when the time comes. That's a nice, sorry. 
I always I run like a race. Race. No, 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 that That's okay to say too. I'm not trying to be a spiritual elitist. Like I want to get home safely when the time comes. It's not about the words. It's not. I'm not mocking the content. I'm mocking the like. The problem is when our petitions become so formulaic. I'm only two percent present when I say it. Yes. So like how yeah. how great an offering is that to God? If I'm like, oh, you know, here's a little incense. Here's a couple pieces of fruit. Go nuts. Yeah. Versus like the widow's mite. Oh, that, the widow's yes. mite is like, you know, the, the icon of a of a consecrated and an undivided prayer. This is all I have. Yeah. And the contemplation teaches us to give all we have in petition. They, they cannot be complete without one another as yeah. I see it. I love that. I love that. We had an experience in our word like this is like a few years ago now where someone at the end of a lesson prayed by name for a man in the room who had just lost his job yeah. and it is i think it's the that, presence that, that you were to it felt yeah it was so different it was like right. the realest prayer yeah and it was asking like it like it wasn't whatever happens happens and it's okay it was like we are all like everyone's together here and like we are asking for this very specific thing with all of our intention yeah. and presence and yeah. it that felt totally transcendent like yeah so i i love i've never like put my finger on it that i think yes. that's what it was totally i love that beautiful yeah well thank you that was yeah i, <laughs> I think that's if, really it feels like with, with all of these things we're talking about there's there's an ele this element of transcend and include right like yeah. we're not saying mm, yeah. we're moving beyond faith to doubt and we're not saying we're moving yeah. on beyond petitionary prayer to contemplative prayer yeah like totally. all of these things are it's it's including all of them too. yeah totally i mean where where would we go but yeah. right here where is there yeah. to go but yeah. right here but if we can include more of the fullness in right now yeah 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 that, that's my hope for all of us yeah love that latter-day saints and humans yeah i had do we have time i have one more thing i really would love oh no to way talk we're, about. oh we're good really? okay I, I really would love oh to hear you talk about so you kind of talk about how in a really crude way like the problem in christianity is sin and the problem in buddhism is suffering and yeah, I, I think, you know, the way if you're going to sum it up in a sentence, yeah, yeah, sin and suffering. Yeah. So I really <laughs> like how you I don't I felt like when the course was over, like those felt so much more like the same thing, like they felt so similar. And I wondered if you could just talk about like, yeah, energy centers. And, and um, is it Thomas <laughs> Keating that talks about the yeah, that what if original sin is just the alienation from God? And like, right. does, is that what is causing suffering? And, you know, in that sense, like these yeah. don't seem like two opposite problems. These seem like, you know, yeah. very similar. So I'd love for you to just take a second and talk about yeah, sin and suffering. Totally. Yeah, it's a big one. Um, well, it's, it's one of those moments where, you know, throughout the course and just the creating of the curriculum, I wanted to like really be alive to the tension of sameness and difference. Mm. And like everything's the same and everything's different. So how do you kind of weave that yeah. into something artful that is, you know, perhaps even helpful to some of us in our spiritual lives? And here's an example. So the, the basic Buddhist framing of like, what's our dilemma? Well, it's that we suffer as human beings. How do we how do we become free of suffering? And in Christianity, there's sin. And, you know, how do we become saved from sin? And they're the same and they're the and they're different like when you when i pushed i learned more i'll just say i learned more about myself and about my spirituality just creating this content than anything mm -hmm. i've done previously it just mm -hmm. left me feeling like wow like what a wonder this human experience is and then this was one of those moments sin and suffering um you're asking me like to emphasize how they're the same in this moment well i just felt like it, it's what you said it was it's very it felt useful to understand that maybe these are more similar than I thought. Like I've always looked at them very separately, but it seems like the more I think about sin, yeah. the more it feels like suffering. If I were to put it really succinctly or try to, it's this question that comes up when I really look deeply at sin and suffering. Like what is sin but our deepest suffering? If we didn't suffer, would there still be sin? And I'm not, I'm not saying that glibly like i i want i would want you and everybody listening perhaps to investigate that like okay what if i just reframe this person that person my own sinfulness what if that's just coming from the depths of my own suffering and what if when i really investigate my own suffering i notice every time i'm really suffering that's when i act out 
that's when I do something that's contrary to the law of the gospel and the mm -hmm. cosmos. So there is a way in which I found just in my own investigation, like, oh, wow, these are, they're, they're expressing something differently that leads to different religious behaviors and spiritual practices and traditions. But like right down at the core of it, they're, they're talking about something that is like so deeply one. Mm -hmm. And yet, if I can pick up the different side of the street, if, if we are sinful, the tendency, if that runs, if that runs off the rails or goes too far, I will experience my nature as being very other than Christ's or God's. That's something I, I've kind of learned in my own investigation. You might find something different, but sin can potentially exaggerate the difference between our humanity and divinity. Mm -hmm. um, if we just look at suffering, if we go too far with the suffering paradigm, I've learned this just in my you know lifetime in Buddhism, but there's something so significant and that feels so spiritually insightful and just cosmologically real about an intercessor or a savior. If there's only suffering, if there's no sin, well then like mechanically I can just meditate and if I know, oh, I don't, I have an itch right now, but I'm not gonna scratch it because I'm gonna like have equanimity with my itch. And you know, I do that enough times and boom, no more suffering, I'm saved. I just saved myself. Mm -hmm. The illusion that we can run into if we're not aware of sin and savior, sin and salvation, is that it, this whole question of like, what, by what grace am I actually saved? Mm -hmm. What is this mystery that saves me? So there's a devotional aspect, there's a relational aspect to be in relationship with a savior and saving grace in Christianity is a dimension of reality that I found to be more elusive mm. in the Buddhist tradition. Mm. But again, that's open for discussion. But it's yeah. totally intriguing to me to like really push into these framings and see what they reveal to us about who we are, about our own yeah. spirituality, and maybe about what comes, what God wants next for us in our lives. I think yeah. suffering has a lot to teach us about, you know, if, if there were if there were a tradition that could help me suffer less and therefore sin less, call it Buddhism. <laughs> I think God would be well pleased with that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, that was a really fascinating part of the course to dive yeah. pretty deep into that. Yeah. Yeah, I really, so, I, I really hope I did appreciated it some that. justice. No, here, yes, know. that was so great. It just, it, it's what you said. Like, it, it's just, it feels like such a, a, a useful thing to just consider and, and think about the ways that is the way is my framing of sin actually causing more alienation from God? Yes. You know, like, yeah. it's just, a, it's yeah. a useful, like, thought to just to weigh and look at and turn over and, yeah. you know, think about is the, is this, is the paradigm itself causing some separation? Yes. Yeah. And that, that was really the, I mean, that's a lot of the tension right now in the Buddhist, between the Buddhist and Christian worlds, let's say, mm -hmm. and hopefully in our interspiritual work moving forward, we can be a part of that dissolution of that estrangement yeah. that I think from a Buddhist point of view, it's like, if you just see yourself as fundamentally fallen and Latter-day Saints have, you know, something quite different to bring to this conversation yeah. than others. But, you know, in general, if you just see yourself as fallen, like, what about your pure nature? Mm -hmm. And this is a complex conversation, but I think there's no question, like in spite of our best intentions, we, because of our own framework around sin, we can forget about our, our pure nature in a way that right. maybe other faith traditions um, have found a way to preserve mm -hmm. a little bit more truly. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, maybe as we as we wrap up, one of the most fascinating parts of the course to me was, and I think it was near the end. Um, you talked about strengths and weaknesses of oh, yeah. each yeah, of each totally. tradition. And actually, Aubrey and I a couple of years ago we did a little very mini series on, on the podcast about what we called it gems and and baggage. And we were looking specifically at the oh, cool. at the Latter Day Saint tradition. Cool. Um, but maybe that maybe that's a, a good place to end. Uh, maybe I was sweating bullets that day in the <laughs> well, workshop. Oh, that's why I, that's like, why I brought oh, it up. Man, they're coming for me. It's all over. Um, <laughs> I had a good run. I think I think it's I think it's really valuable. And if if you if you'd like, we can end on the strengths of Christianity because then everyone will leave with it. With <laughs> Don't it. make me go back there, Tim. I'll take the strengths. You yeah. take the weaknesses. Um, are you asking about the strengths of yeah. Christianity? I mean, and to, I think Christianity is what I'm most interested in for this question. If to the extent you want to, I mean, in the course you talk about Buddhism yeah. as well. Um, 
but I, I'd like to hear a little bit on on weaknesses and strengths and there yeah. comparatively. Yeah, no, let's let's all talk about it for a minute here. And and should we get more specific in the course? I really wanted to um, spring a broad tent for like humanity. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. I I focus less on uh, restored gospel mm -hmm. to make it more inclusive to the broader Christian community. Yeah. Um, do you want to look at Christianity or do you want to look at restored gospel or if you've got restored gospel off the top of your head I think that would be really interesting. That's the most interesting to me. I, okay. I definitely yeah, have let's a, do that. Yeah strength And like let's let's let this be a you know yeah. Emergent conversation if you all have something okay. like right at the top of mind by all means, but I'm just kind of feeling into yeah. What's true now? strength this could be underrated i got one but like in in god's great wisdom and in like allowing this tradition to be forged uh on the wasatch front with a people under duress mm -hmm. like what i find baked in you mentioned this earlier but baked in now to the tradition i would argue it's not just a you know like a a cultural phenomenon that glanced off us, but like I feel like baked into the tradition is a sense of concrete care and service. Mm -hmm. And it's rare. I haven't seen an organism like it on the planet. That 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 is a tribulation that God has magnified into a completely unique gem on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. I love that. That's just a warm yeah. up. Yeah. Boom. You guys go. <laughs> yeah. Let's just knock it back and forth. I mean, community is the thing that comes to mind first for me. Like, just how, <clears throat> I mean, even just logistically, the, the fact that, like, we are just set up to be, to intersect with so many other lives on such a regular basis, and we don't have to do that ourselves. Like, it just, it's set up for us. I think that all by itself can be such <clears throat> a gift. <clears throat> um, But, since that's kind of the one you said, I think another thing that I do value is how much it's sort of just part of our culture to, to like, we're active. We're like active. I mean, it's funny that we use that word, but like it's, we're, it's such an active faith. Like it's, it just feels like a, and maybe this is one of those things that can be a weakness too, but I, I appreciate how much a part of my mind and my daily life are tradition is like mm -hmm, it's something mm -hmm. where there's always there's always something to be done and mm -hmm. it, it it's feels like it seeps into every part of our life in a way mm -hmm. that i haven't always appreciated but i think that actually could be a strength like yeah. it could be a strength that that's normal yeah totally. for it to affect every every context mini context during the day yeah absolutely agree beautiful hmm. i've been uh, i've been trying to think of something that's not super cliched um I think for me, one actual strength is, and I think people may listen to this and say, oh, that's just being, you know, a high demand religion. But mm -hmm. like, it, like being such a big part of my life um, has, it, it, it's sort of like a forced encounter with what's, with what's real. Like it's, mm -hmm. you cannot say, I don't think about the Latter-day Saint tradition that it's, that, that it's casual, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And because it involved it like it um it has things to say about what i'm doing all day every day you know what i what i ingest you know yeah. about my sexuality about my <laughs> my schedule everything <laughs> it it has forced me to confront all those different aspects of my life and the way richard Rohr might put this is it gives me something to push against yeah you know and yeah. i think a more a more casual a more casual faith might might allow might allow for an a more unexplored life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with that. I guess. Yeah, yeah, something to push against. I think yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. You know what came up as you two were sharing? Um, I remember I was like at a, a Christian retreat with people from other denominations about two years ago, and as part of the closing, we were invited to like bless each other, go wow. out, go out and prosper, go forth and bless and you know we went around like offering one another blessings and um <clears throat> i was self-conscious about it at the time but look back on it as a moment like oh that's really the restored gospel it oh. makes it 
um, very unique as a gift, I think, which is like, as people were blessing each other, it was, you know, may God bless you with health and wholeness and confidence and wow. may God bless you. And like, you know, you guys know me. I'm like the remedial Latter-day Saint who like is like really late to the party and still like, where is that in the Book of Mormon? Where is ether? Is that before, after, through next? So I'm like pretty pathetic. But like without even thinking about it when it was my turn, this person, I was saying, I bless you with the power to da 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 Like I bless you. And, af and right as I said it, I'm like, I bless you. I just... In an instant, I became aware of everyone's like blessing, like via God, may God, da 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 da. Yeah. And like as Latter day Saints, I believe the, the worldview, the vision, the understanding is that God trusts us with divine power and uses divine power to bless us and to magnify us and to grow us up into the stature of God's. And that came out in just like a basic mm -hmm. utterance of like, when we bless someone, we bl we bless them as gods and goddesses, you know, in training. And it, it wow. really moved me to feel like, oh, wow, like I'm really grateful for that worldview. Mm -hmm. I I'm really grateful to be on the inside of the divine current and not like asking, you know, you know mm -hmm. the the big guns to come in and do it for me yeah so that, that's wow. unique that's a that's such a good point that's one of those things that like even though it's so big like it can almost be invisible yeah you know like we just really take that for granted it that that is our worldview it touches on our whole um theology of divinization which mm -hmm. would be a longer conversation yeah. but yeah like Lots of pearls, lots of yeah. things to touch on. Should we get into the muck? <laughs> yes, Are we out of time? Is that all for the show? Just <laughs> wrap it right there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. What do you What do you think, Avery? We're, yeah, I would love. I it. would love to hear if they're just. I mean, I I think it's I think it's so healthy to talk about that because it's places where we can you know, be healed. It's not something that we're stuck with. Like, I like seeing like what parts of our community are not healthy so that we can we can grow here. Like, where can we grow? Yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah. that's. You know, that's what our weaknesses are for, right? Like, <laughs> let me. So I'll jump in. I'll, I'm going to reprise the weakness I talked about in the course, and I I think I lost sleep for days after that because I'm like, no. I don't. Mm -hmm. My intention is not to criticize. Yeah. You know, unnecessarily. That, that felt clear. Yeah. Okay. So if I can, like, you know, take another crack at it. Um. One of the doctrines that we hear about. It's on high rotation, you could say. It's that like, you know, the Savior, the only begotten Son. Um, it's through Christ that we're saved. It's through like the uh, covenant path that we're redeemed and perfected. Okay, I'm going to say yes to that. And just in my own personal life, I was lost to this tradition. It wasn't, it wasn't active in my life. And it was a Buddhist Roshi, a Zen master, who in his own like Buddhist faith and doubt converted my heart to I don't know what, but it changed it so much that it opened me back up to a whole path, you know, replete with gifts, you mm -hmm. know, namely the restored gospel. So I, I, I'm inclined to move into a paradoxical place with this doctrine on the only begotten son and the covenant path, which from one point of view, it's like, oh, that's a great religion you have, but you don't have the covenant path. You don't have the rites, right. you don't have the rituals, you don't have the sun. But what if we kind of don't have the whole picture on that? What if, what if Christ's atonement and his salvation is interdependent with the truths of other paths? What if, what if we can't even access our own truths, but through other paths? That was oh. the case for me. And I feel like that preserves the integrity of what we take to be true, but it makes some trouble to it, hopefully good trouble. And it says, okay, yeah, we have the covenant path and truths, but do we? Mm -hmm. Because what if there's like a deeper expression of faith for the three of us that we won't even realize for another 50 years until somebody generously offers us the gifts of their traditions that will open us back up to these deeper truths, right? Yeah. We need each other. And I think if I'm going to name a weakness, it's that I often experience a kind of like arrogance and alienation and this like really certain this the certitude of expressing like, oh, we got this. 
And I, I don't think that's, it's bad for a missionary program, but I, I think it even uh, can create a roadblock in our own spiritual development as Latter-day Saints. So, yeah, that's yeah. a really great way to put it. Yeah, and your and your life has kind of has been a, a real testament to that. That you know, it wasn't a <laughs> it wasn't a sorting. It was just like constant, like drawing broader circles and yeah, and yeah, it was just, it's an opening. I I just think you're the guy to talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm the poster it. child. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a really it's <laughs> disarming. It's disarming to see that like to see to hear you explain your journey that it wasn't like it it wasn't about rejecting and you know making columns of like what is true and what is false like it just it feels like you really have had this journey of of opening and opening and like mm. that has has brought you connection and and i think it is really it, it puts in relief something that uh, something that we can do to grow you mm. know? yeah thank you aubrey so. i i hope I deeply hope it's an expression of gathering up all truths. Yeah, so yes, it's my, it's exactly. my best attempt at it today. Yeah. And I'll, I'll die exactly. We truly appreciate yeah. your <laughs> vulnerability and continuing to share your story and your your insights. I mean, through, I mean, being here with us through the course, everything you've done, it's really yeah. appreciated. Yeah, Thank love you, loved the course. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much for listening. We hope that this has been as helpful and enlightening to you as it was for us. Again, if this piqued your interest and you'd like to check out Thomas's course, Gospel Meets Dharma, head to gospelmeetsdharma.com and you can use code LAUNCH20. Again, that's the word LAUNCH in all caps followed by the digits 2 and 0 to get 20% off. Thanks so much and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.